Now, it takes about 16 seconds before when we say something relates to them. So let me just make sure, and I'll tell you when you guys can begin. I have to now go to my page because there's always a 16 second delay from when we say something on StreamYard and it's related to the page. So let me go here and set it up. Okay, see, that's right there. Now let me go here. I'm using my old Mac, guys, not the new one because I had to do some work here. All right, now. I do see it's live. Oh. Yes, yeah, but I just have to click on this one here because I'm also doing it on Facebook. Ah. And awesome. here it is. Okay, we're ready. We're ready now. We're here. We're live. So, Brother William, I'm going to let you take the forefront because you yep. brought this esteemed guest, a bona fide scholar of the highest eminence, all glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit, Dr. Robert Fastigi, whom I knew in my anti Catholic days <laughs> when I was more anti Catholic and more Reformed because I saw him debate. One of my heroes at that time, Robert Morey. But now it's good to be on the same stream with someone now that I love and respect because God has done a work in me and changed my attitude towards the Catholic Church. But I'm going to recede. You introduce the guest, introduce the theme of the topic, and I will facilitate in the background. And you guys can then begin in prayer when you feel the need to start. Definitely. Thank you very much for having us here, Sam. And let me um, let me introduce my dear friend here. Uh, for people that may not know who Dr. Fastigi is. He is a master of theology and a very near and dear friend of mine. We've been friends for many years now, but I want to tell people something very quick before we even begin, before my friend uh, even d dives in. People know me very well for debating a lot, and I debate a lot. I'm a debate junkie. People have asked me before, who has been your greatest inspiration? And my favorite debater ever has been my dear friend here. I don't think there's a better debater, a better Catholic debater than Dr. Fastigi. He is an inspiration. He is a, a, a master. And I, in the link on the right-hand side in the chat, I put a link where people can get a hold of Denzinger, which he is one of the master translators of that. You got to get a hold of that. And today, we're going to be talking about the Council of Nicaea, icon image veneration. Uh, it is going to be an incredible show. And people, they have really really been wanting to have this show and before we even dig in i want to say the reason we're doing it is because the act of the council the dogmatic decrees what the council was all about it really does confuse our evangelical friends but not only then i have had a number of catholic and eastern orthodox friends that have reached out to me that really don't know okay well if the act that says it this is that official binding. Um, people, just a lot of confusion there. But before we even did uh, dive in, my dear friend, Dr. Fistigi, how have you been and how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, uh, William. Thank you for your kind words. But I, I'm a student. Uh, I'm still learning. And uh, we do what we can with God's help, you know. Amen. And I learned from you and, and, and Father, the great Father Capus. And I learned from Holy Mother Catholic Church. So Amen. we try to be faithful, faithful sons of the church. Yes, no, without a doubt. And we all learn from one another. And uh, that, that is a beautiful joy in, in being able to do these incredible, wonderful shows together. Uh, I do want to begin, and, and maybe uh, I'll begin with prayer and ask for, we'll pray to our triune God and then ask for the intercession of Holy Mary for the show. We can begin with the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, please guide us today in this session. Allow us to be able to Speak the clarity that is found in your holy and errant word, in your incredible, incredibly blessed ecumenical councils, in particular, Second Council of Nicaea, too. We ask for you to bless this session, and we also ask for the intercession of our Holy Mother Mary, St. Mary, as she is affectionately known by our Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters, our Holy Theotokos, as she is lovingly known by our Eastern brothers and sisters, and we ask for her intercession, and we pray and we ask all of this, Lord, in, in your name, Lord, and we ask for this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. With that, I will uh, I'll get the ball rolling and ask you, my dear friend, thrilled to be here with you. Let me ask you this. When it comes to the Second Council of Nicaea, do you also encounter a little bit of confusion at times with people not really knowing how to distinguish between uh, what is really binding and dogmatic from the council and really looking at the act and believing anything you read in the act is also binding? You know, have you ever encountered that as well? 
Yeah, well, sometimes people are looking for uh, ammunition in their polemical stand, and so they'll pick something out from it. The Octa, which did not make it into the official uh, pronouncement of the Council. So I, I'm more familiar with some of the Octa of the Second Vatican Council, and I've, I follow, uh, I can read Latin, and I see some of the discussions that went on, and they're interesting, but that's background. It's what was voted on, what was decided, and from a Catholic perspective, what was confirmed by the Roman pontiff. That's very, very important to understand. We have uh, the example of the robber council of Ephesus in 449, where the emperor was promoting monophysitism. And uh, Pope Leo the Great had written this wonderful tome, this letter to Patriarch Flavian. And um, when monophysitism, the one, the one nature heresy was being promoted in 449, the papal legates tried to protest. Patriarch Flavian tried to read uh, the Holy Father, the, the Pope's uh, letter, and he was not, he was prevented and he was beaten up and he died. When Leo the Great heard about this council, which thought it would be like ecumenical, he said, this wasn't a council, it was a robbery. So to this day, it's called the, the robber council of, of, uh, of Ephesus. And then two years later, there was an authentic ecumenical council, uh, Chalcedon, or Chalcedon as some people call it. And uh, there the true doctrine of the two natures of Christ was affirmed, two natures acknowledged in, in, in one person. And the two natures come together without confusion or change, without division or separation. So I know uh, people could pick out octa. Sometimes there's an element of truth in what is said, but it might be considered uh, uh, emotional. Uh, uh, some people were making these points, but um, we, we don't go by the octa. They're interesting to read. We have to go by what the council itself decreed. Yeah, that, that is a really good point because, um, and, and we'll get to um, a particular council, uh, Hyria, Hyria, however you pronounce it. We'll talk about that later on because uh, when it comes to whether or not a council is ecumenical or not, it's a great point that you bring up there and a number of things that we have to really ponder upon. Now, to really kind of get the ball rolling, when we talk about a veneration of images, we talk about a veneration of icons, uh, one thing that uh, we hear a lot of criticism on is that there really is no biblical basis, we are told. But of course, we, we can, uh, when we differentiate between what is idolatry and what is actually proper utilization of images in the Old Testament in particular, um, you find images used all over the Old Testament. Ezekiel 41, you've got the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the temple, Solomon's temple. You have a number of a number of very important examples. So I think when you draw that distinction between idolatry and a proper utilization of images as was uh, ordered even by God, you know, if images were evil in worship or in holy places, you you wouldn't expect them to be ordered to be made by God. Wouldn't you agree with that, Dr. C.G.? Exactly. And we, we consider the sacred scriptures divinely inspired. And we have cases of like the bronze serpent being lifted up well, that was a graven image, but it was not an idol. And then we also have uh, the cherubim there on the Ark of the Covenant with their faces uh, looking at each other. So this was, a, a, you know, something uh, made, an image. So what was prohibited in the Ten Commandments was bowing down to worship an idol. Yep. And we have to say, well, what is an idol? An idol would be something created that you're bowing down and worshiping uh, as if it were divine. Mm -hmm. And it, that's different than an image or an icon. Remember uh, St. Paul um, in Colossians says, Jesus is the icon of the invisible God. Mm -hmm. So that, that there we have the word icon or image. So it's really a denial of the incarnation yeah. uh, to be an iconoclast. 
and there the, 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 the were these emperors like Leo the Third, the Byzantine emperor, promoting iconoclasm, the destruction or the opposition to images. And there's debates about what inspired these iconoclasts. Some thought this was the purity of religion. And so they were trying to be obedient to what how they interpreted the Bible. Others say there was the Muslim influence because the Muslims are iconoclasts. And so they thought, well, this would give us greater respect and the Muslims would not be able to uh, uh, criticize us as idol worshipers and, yeah. and, and, and so on. Unfortunately, after all these councils which approved the veneration of images, it came back during the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. And, and Luther was not an extreme iconoclast. He allowed uh, even the corpus on the crucifix, but it was some of the Calvinists and some of the Anabaptists and, uh, who became iconoclastic. And even to this yeah. day, among Protestants, um, evangelicals, there's division. Some yeah. will allow a certain image uh, and others will not allow any whatsoever. Yep. Of course, here with the Eastern Orthodox, we feel right at home because yeah. they consider the Second Council of Nicaea to be ecumenical, and it certainly approved the veneration of icons. And iconography and veneration of icons is very important, especially for Byzantine Christians, whether Catholic or Orthodox, and uh, you, we, we, you, I'm sure you have been to a Byzantine church where there's the iconostasis, you know, the screen of the holy icons, and so there's a whole theology and spirituality around the veneration of icons. But we, we this is where there was the clear distinction made between uh, the bowing down in reverence, the proskanesis, yeah. uh, towards images. And then the latria or latreia due to God alone. And so we, we, we could only really worship God with lat latria. Yeah. And then uh, later with the, the Blessed Mother, she could be given dulia. That was considered a better word than proskenesis because you could bow down in, with latria or you could bow down with veneration. So mm -hmm. then Julia was more like honor or veneration, and that became the preferred term. And with the Blessed Mother, you could give her the highest veneration you can to any creature, hyperdulia, but you we cannot worship her. She's not yeah. God, she's a creature. And 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 we're not worshiping the um the matter, you know, the 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 paint uh, or the mosaics, the matter. What, as as the Council of uh, Second Council of Nicaea said, the honor given to the image goes yeah. to the one who is represented. So this is, uh, the, the, it, and and it's considered rooted in the faith. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it 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 is. Who is going to decide this? If there's opposition to images, well, you have the authority of the church, yeah. and it wasn't just the Second Council of Nicaea. It was the Fourth Council of Constantinople. It was the Council of Trent when this was challenged again, the veneration of relics and images and so on. So we believe that the Holy Spirit guides the Catholic Church, guides the bishops, guides the popes, guides ecumenical councils. So this, uh, to be opposed to the veneration of images would be heretical. Yeah. And that's what we have to see. And that's why there was a, a anathemas. That just means, well, it, it could mean accursed, but a, a more polite definition would be condemned. Mm -hmm. it, with, the, with the English Denzinger, we just kept it in the Latin, anathema sit, let that one be anathema. So rather than to try to translate it. I'll get to that, uh, the anathema in a moment, because I, that those are great points. I, I wrote down a number of points you made, and they are masterful. Dr. Pustici, at Nicaea II, uh, you're correct. A number of passages from the Bible are quoted. And today I have seen a number of evangelicals. One in particular did a show 
not long back uh, by the name of Dr. Ortland, who, uh, with respect, I say, I think he, he gets it wrong. Uh, and a number of other evangelicals who will criticize Nicaea too and say, well, look, look, and I'm not saying that Dr. Ortland said this, but others will say, well, look at the buffoonery of Nicaea too. They are quoting all of these passages about the incarnation. What are they doing? They're not even talking about images there. But Dr. Fastigi, you made the masterful point that their very point of the iconodules, the iconophiles, those that defended images, was that this was a denial of the incarnation. Yeah. That is why they were quoting them. And evangelicals that accuse the fathers of buffoonery don't even realize why they were quoting the Psalms and all of these passages that talk about the image or, or, or even the icon in the New Testament. They're talking about the incarnation and the fathers were arguing this roundabout uh, meant the denial of the incarnation. And really, that is something problematic when they don't focus upon that. It's, isn't that right, Dr. Fastigi? Yes, I think, I, think, I think you're absolutely right, William. The, the incarnation is the enfleshment, you know, the uh, carne, you know, in, incarnatus est. And, and so, or the, the Greek root would be sarx, flesh. And so the, the word becomes flesh. Flesh is matter. So by becoming flesh, taking a human nature from the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, matter is sanctified. Yeah. That's what we have to realize. It's the incarnational principle. And so God made himself known by assuming a human nature, and he becomes the icon of the invisible God. That's why uh, in the Gospel of John, Philip says, show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus says to uh, 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 Philip, have you been with me all this time and you still don't know me? Yeah. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Well, seeing is something sent through the senses. Yep. So we see Jesus who is, has a full human nature. So we, we see the face of the living God. Yeah. You know, back in the Old Testament, they begged, you know, Moses begged to see the face of God. And, and he's told, no, any, you cannot see the face of God and live. I'll show you my backside, you know. Yeah, and yeah. there's even when the 70 elders go up and they beheld the God of Israel, they see under his feet like sapphire tile work. What m many Jewish scholars say is that, oh, they, they didn't actually see his face. They saw the glory coming, the Shekinah yeah. coming, emanating. Right. Uh, from from him but Jesus is the face of God he's the icon of God so there's something really anti-incarnational about iconoclasm if the yeah. word became flesh the flesh the human nature of 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 Jesus was hypostatically united to his it was united hypostatically to his divine person but it was seen so we as human beings are creatures of the senses. Mm -hmm. And so the sacraments are sensible signs of invisible grace. So notice some of the iconoclasts among Protestants today, they're also anti-sacramental. Yep. And so what really, it, be, it becomes almost like a, a type of Gnosticism. It's all in the mind or, or, or uh, you know, you, you believe. You know, you, you, you have faith. Well, all of that is very good. But why would our Lord give us his body and blood? So we say in the Eucharist, it's body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now it's under the, the, the species, the appearances of bread and wine, but the, there's something sensate there. You know, the bread and wine have been changed. So our Lord himself wanted to mediate his presence uh, through sensible reality, sensible signs. And so now the, the iconoclasts are deep down, they're rejecting the incarnation or the, the full meaning of the incarnation. And that's why some of them are uh, also, um, they don't believe in the real substantial presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. No, those are really, really good examples of, because really at the heart of it, um, as the fathers pointed out, is a denial of the incarnation. And you brought up, you brought up how 
this came up again at the time of the Reformation, and indeed it did. And what a big problem for, in my opinion, uh, and, and you're right, Luther uh, wasn't perhaps as as um, as bad as a, a John Calvin or a Francis Turretin or many of the other later reformers who were very anti-image, um, and some just completely anti-image total. Um, but it is problematic because you have the great St. John Damascene in his dialogues uh, against the Muslims of his time, uh, really pointing out that this really amounted to uh, anti-incarnation theology. You're right about that, Dr. Fistici. And yet you've got the Protestant reformers adopting these very arguments. And the problem is that not only do they adopt them, but they also begin to utilize pseudonymous texts that were used at the council by the iconoclasts, um, texts that were fake, falsely attributed to figures such as uh, St. Epiphanius and others. Now, this really is a problem. And I think that if our evangelical friends would do a deep dive into history, uh, they would realize how, uh, how much against Christian history this position really is. In my opinion, Dr. Fasigi, it's not a tenable position to hold. And it really does amount to a lot of problems, especially if you look at how images were utilized in the Old Testament and throughout church history. W would you say it's a fair assessment? Yes, exactly. The, the you know, iconoclasm emerged and it was resisted by the popes. And and so when, when this is the letter of Gregory II from around the year 726 or 730, it's in Denzinger, but he wrote a letter to uh, the emperor uh, Leo the third who was nicknamed the iconoclast and he the holy father responds and says and you claim that we worship rocks and walls and wooden panels it is not as you say emperor rather it is for remembrance on our part and to rouse us for the lifting up of our minds sluggish and weak as it is that is the reason for the names and the invocation and the images and not as gods as you claim Far from it, for our hopes are not based on them. And if there is an image of the Lord, we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, help us and save us. Or if there is, a, is one of his holy mother, we say, Holy God bearer, mother of the Lord, intercede with your son, our true God, for the salvation of our souls. Or if it is one of the martyrs, St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, who poured out your blood for the sake of Christ, intercede for us as one who can speak easily with him. So, and it, uh, so in other words, the Pope was responding to the iconoclast emperor. And so this is, um, this is just, the question is who has the authority? Yeah. You know, the iconoclast um, emperor or the Pope or right. the ecumenical council. Yeah. It was recognized as ecumenical by by uh, Catholic East and West, yeah, East and West, and and so where are we going to go? Who's going to guide us? That's why our Lord established a church, and uh, uh, commissioned the apostles, and their successors are the bishops, and the successor Amen. Peter, we believe, is the Roman Pontiff, the Pope. Yeah. So these are the ones with the authority, especially when they gather together in an ecumenical council to resolve these matters. So this is the the problem with private interpretation that individuals think they know better than the church but this mm -hmm. is these matters have been so uh, resolved and then iconoclasm uh, emerged during the, uh, the protestant reformation not in all the protestants but a good right. number of them uh, but this is mm -hmm. you know during the middle ages you had such beautiful art oh, and, yeah. and, and beautiful churches and then during the renaissance and all of this and and this is this is giving glory to God. Amen. You know, yeah. beautiful artwork gives glory to God, but um, this this reaction is, is is a regression back, you know, to the eighth century when there yeah. was this this heretical movement of iconoclasm, and that's what it was. There were earlier church fathers who defended images. St. John of Damascus defended them. 
um, and 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 you had so many others, Saint mm -hmm. Theodore the Studite, and others. All these holy men, as well as popes, councils, uh, and it wasn't just Second Nicaea. It was reaffirmed at the Fourth Council of Constantinople, at the Council of Trent. So, this is dogmatic Catholic teaching. It's yeah. also considered. Uh, uh, a dogma for the Eastern Orthodox yeah. to venerate images. And, well, if one enters into a church and shows disrespect to images, that's, uh, uh, that's considered a type of sacrilege. And, you know, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Go no, ahead. no. And, and I think that's what is being said by some of the Okta. They're trying to stress mm -hmm. the importance of veneration. And, uh, and and that's what we see in, in the Second Council of Nicaea, that uh, we are obliged to show proper veneration to these holy images, to sacred yeah. images. And really, then, if there was the destruction of a sacred image, it's a type of blasphemy, you know. Yeah. And and that's what we we would have to have to realize. So I, um, it's just so beautiful the way it's put and it's uh, recorded in Denzinger and some of the other canons are there in in um Tanner's uh translation of the um of the uh of of of, of the canons of of Nicaea 2 but um this is what it says we continuing on the royal path and following the divinely inspired teaching of our holy fathers and the tradition of the catholic church which we recognize, in fact, as the Holy Spirit dwelling in her, defined with all precision and care, that just like the figure of the precious and life-giving cross, so also venerable and holy images, whether painted in mosaic or those made of any other suitable material, are to be placed in the holy churches of God and on sacred vessels and vestments, on walls and panels, in homes, and along roads, namely the image of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, of our undefiled Lady, the Holy Mother of God, and of venerable angels, and of all the saints and pious men. And then, in fact, the more frequently these are seen through iconic representation, the more those who contemplate them are moved to remember and long for their original models and to give them salutation and respectful veneration. This, however, is not actual worship, which according to our faith is reserved to the divine nature alone, but as it is done for the figure of the glorious and life-giving cross, the holy gospels and all other sacred objects, let these images be honored with an offering of incense and light according to the long-standing pious custom. And this is the key point. For the honor rendered to the image passes on to the original. And he who venerates an image venerates in it the person whom the image represents. So that's a yeah. citing of fourth century father of the church, St. Basil. St. Basil, right? yep. And so uh, this was already established teaching. The church fathers were witnessing to it. But then you have this heretical movement in the eighth century. And some Protestant apologists are claiming, well, that's an ecumenical council, you know, the, the Council of Heria yeah. uh, that you mentioned. But uh, I, I, it's not. An ecumenical council, uh, uh, from an Orthodox perspective, would have to have the approval of, of the great uh, patriarchs of the time. Yeah. And from a Catholic perspective, it would ultimately have to receive um, approval or a recognition as ecumenical by the Pope. That just doesn't uh, qualify uh, with this, um, uh, what is sometimes called a headless council, a mock yeah. council. And um, so this uh, council of Heria, or uh, he he Heria would be, I think, how it would be pronounced. It is really not at all an ecumenical council. It was a heretical council. Yeah. It was very problematic, um, uh, problematic in terms of its theology, and, and you're right. Um, either which way you look at it, <clears throat> with respect to our Eastern friends, 
uh, they would not consider it ecumenical. And we wouldn't either. No. That is a really, really important point we have to make. And I think you you brought up a really good point how our Eastern friends venerate images. We venerate images. But another thing, Dr. Fustigi, before we went live, we were briefly talking about our uh, Oriental Orthodox friends. And we were talking about a, a mutual, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine by the name of Dr. Brock. And Dr. Brock is an Oriental Orthodox scholar. And as you know very well, um, at Second Nicaea, the Oriental Orthodox were not united with us. They were not. Um, they were no longer part of us. We believe that they schismed off, but that's a topic for another day. We have great respect for them. We love them. Uh, but the issue is, and the reason I bring them up, is because I was dialoguing with my friend, Dr. Brock, the other day, um, and I, the topic came up again. Whereas I asked him, well, do the Oriental Orthodox venerate images? And he, he didn't even waste a second. He affirmed it. Without a doubt, we do. To me, Dr. Fustici, um, the claim that Nicaea too was an evolution of something that wasn't there before, uh, you got a big problem because what are you going to do with the Oriental Orthodox who were no longer, had not been a part of, of, uh, of the fold for several hundred years and they believe in venerating images today. Indeed, Dr. Brock told me their great saint, St. Ephraim, St. Jacob, and many others, there are texts indicative of them venerating images. So the evangelicals are in a big bind when all of the apostolic communions believe in venerating images, and they believe, as St. Basil said, that the veneration honor goes to the prototype. Um, that is really important because... We don't believe in, and, and I don't have an image with me in hand, but uh, we don't believe that we're actually giving honor and veneration to a piece of marble or, or to ink, but we believe it goes to the one being represented. Isn't that correct to say, Dr. Bustigi? Exactly, exactly. You know, and then all the churches of apostolic origin uh, uh, venerate icons. You know, the, the Assyrian Church of the East, which was separated after the Council of Ephesus 431, partially because their, their centers were under the Persian Empire. Uh, and then the Oriental Orthodox who did not accept the Council of Chalcedon. Yeah, yeah. Now, some scholars say some of this is doing, had to do with translation of terms. But actually with, with the Church of the East, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Christological and Mariological problem was resolved in 1994 right where they they said we honor mary, uh, mary as the mother of christ our god and savior but we also accept the legitimacy of calling her theotokos or mother yeah. of god or birth giver of god so that that's been overcome with the armenians who were oriental orthodox that is monophysite not accepting uh the council of chalcedon Mm -hmm. In 1996, Saint Paul, the uh, Saint John Paul II, was able to have a joint Christological agreement with them, yeah. and they were willing, avoiding the term two natures. They said, you know, the humanity and the divinity come together in the one person, without confusion or change, yeah. without yeah. division or separation, the same language as Chalcedon. So there have there the, through dialogue through discussion, through mutual love, some of these divisions can be healed, or at least on certain theological points, uh, they can be healed. But uh, yeah. this is what, it, what is sad is in these days of ecumenical dialogue, there are certain Protestant polemicists who are anti-Catholic. They're also anti-Orthodox, but oh, for yeah. whatever reason, they, uh, they're more focused on the Catholic Church, yeah, rather than yeah. the Eastern Orthodox, which they often they don't know too much about. Uh, yeah, but they're all, gonna... yeah, there are also Eastern Orthodox polemicists who are anti-Catholic too. Yeah, and I think it really does stem from really a lot of the Protestants don't understand the Eastern Orthodox um, theology. I think that's kind of why uh, I've even heard uh, a uh, an individual that we both dealt with, uh, Dr. White, just be completely confused on uh, as to what Eastern Orthodox believes. So I think that might be a reason why they um, they go at us a little bit more. But they, but you know the the good thing is our Eastern Orthodox friends 
are realizing more and more that when they attack councils like Second Nicaea, they're attacking them as well. I mean, they're realizing that more and more that these polemics are aimed at them as well. And I, I think you, you, you brought up a very good point, that great point of multiple Christological joint statements where you have these churches, in, in essence, uh, agreeing on the very same things. When it comes to Christology, Dr. Fisticci, that's a masterful point because we have our a lot of our Oriental Orthodox friends who in many years past, unfortunately, Catholics would make the same mistake where uh, they would just really, we'd really go at each other in terms of Christology. The Oriental Orthodox would say, well, look, Pope St. Leo was confusing the Christology of St. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. But we realize, as you pointed out, Dr. Fistigi, different language and terminology may be used. At the end of the day, we have signed joint declarations saying we are on the same page when it comes to Christology. That, to me, is, is a massive step forward. Um, but when it comes to other, other things, uh, our evangelical friends are just really stuck. And you brought it up earlier, and I want to talk about it briefly. Uh, they're really stuck on... Uh, Latria Dulia, and I'm using the Latin terms, uh, Latria Dulia Proscuneo, uh, they really are stuck in it saying, well, look, uh, what are you doing giving uh, Proscuneo uh, to, an, to a statue, to an icon, to an image? What are you doing? This amounts to you giving it Latria. This amounts to idolatry. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Fastigi, but any kind of uh, proscuneo, and by the way, when we say proscuneo, uh, we're talking about uh, prostration. We're talking about, in this particular context, we're talking about the utilization of the Greek term proscuneo for veneration. And we don't give veneration to a mere statue, to marble, to ink. We're directing it, as St. Basil says, to the prototype. I think they're really confusing a lot of the language of the of the scriptures, Dr. Fistigi. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, I, I think absolutely. Um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's cases of bowing down before angels in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. creatures. You know, in, in, in Catholic moral theology, we, it, it's in the catechism, you have to look at the moral object, you have to look at the intention, and you have to look at circumstances. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're going to say someone is committing idolatry, you would have to know what is intended by the bowing down, let's say, in prayer before an icon or a statue of the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. And if you, it, it, it's it's a it's really the uh, the violation of the eighth commandment of rash judgment to say that person is committing idolatry, because you don't know that. Yeah. You don't yeah. know that. You'd have to ask and talk to the person. What are you doing? Well, I'm praying yeah. before yeah. my mother, an image of my mother. I mean, if we were, if we, we had a photograph of my mother's deceased for quite, quite a number of years, but if I had a photograph of her and I would just be showing honor and respect and remembrance of my mother, um, I wouldn't be worshiping her, you know, uh, um, now that no, no, they, 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 we sometimes use uh, the term matinee idol or rock star idol. Well, if people are worshiping you know, a uh, David Bowie or any rock star or who, who whomever, um, this is wrong. Yeah, but, yeah. but but the language comes in there that just means they have great, you know, uh, respect or love for this performer. You know, so we, 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 we use it that way. But we have to be careful never to um, honor something that is not God as God. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, the human nature of our Lord, since it was united to his divine person, is also worthy of worship. Right. This right. took a while to develop, but the, the Second Council of Constantinople 553 said there's one act of worship to both natures. It's not like you you have you you we worship the divine nature and and, and then you know venerate the human nature. No, since the human nature is inseparable and hypostatic it, it, it's hypostatically united to his divine person yeah we worship christ who is divine and human and then later the jansenists started attacking the worship of the sacred heart and yeah. and this 
at the Synod of Pistoia, but Pius the uh, uh, um, sixth, when he responded to the Jansenist inspired Synod of Pistoia in Northern Italy, made it clear that we can worship the sacred heart of Jesus with Latria because his yeah. sacred heart is hypostatically united. It's inseparable from his divine person. So, so our Lord is God, but also man, but we worship his sacred humanity. Yeah. This is very, very important. We don't split Jesus up. He's divine and human. The two <clears throat> natures come together without confusion or change, but without division or separation. And then Venerable Pius XII, in an encyclical letter, Arietus Aquas, reaffirmed that the sacred heart of Jesus is worthy of the, the uh, of latria, the worship due to God alone. So we can worship the sacred heart. We can venerate the immaculate heart of Mary, um, but we can never worship her. The church is yeah. very clear about this. Vatican II is, is clear about this. But, you know, uh, Sam mentioned Dr. Mori. I remember our when we had our debate and he just said, well, you know, uh, uh, I look at, you know, you could make these fancy distinctions between Latria and Dulia. But he said, when I see... Jose bowing before a statue of the Blessed Mother. He's worshiping her. Well, uh, how can he say that? He doesn't how can know he what read his heart. Yeah, he, he he can't read his heart. So this is a, a classic case of rash judgment. You know that that yeah. uh, we have to be careful about that. Um, you know, sometimes there's gestures and and images and so on. Um, that's why I. I, I I don't want to bring it up, but you know when people say there was Pachamama worship, right? And that 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 uh, ceremony, that prayer service in the Vatican Gardens, of October fourth, two thousand nineteen. I kind of bristle because how would you know it's worship? I mean, yeah. I, I, it, how can you? How are you able to read people's hearts? That really, Doctor Pasigi, that really is a gift that uh, I think anybody would want to have, being able to read people's hearts. Um, and and I have never heard your debate with Doctor was is it Doctor was it the, the late Doctor Mori Doctor Mori? Yes, yes. He he had a doctorate. He was a nice man, a very bright man, and um, you know after the debate, he he, he was very friendly and so on. Um, but that's how I got started in in Austin, Texas, and it was just kind of by accident. But Almost it was kind of like in my backyard. Yeah, yeah they, you, they, you, they, you used to teach in Austin, I think. Yes, for 14 years yeah, at yeah. St. Edwards University. And it was like um, they contacted, I think, the chancery, the, the diocese. And they said, we're, we're looking for someone, you know, we just to discuss the differences between Catholics and uh, uh, Protestants. So I just thought it was going to be a friendly discussion, but it was an ambush. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all right. Uh, I, I think we uh, then I, I had some exchanges with uh, James White. And, yeah, uh, and, just and to share, Dr. Fasigi, not to cut you off, just share. Go ahead, Both brother. your debates, the one with Maury and the one with James White, are online on YouTube. Oh, so they're okay. online. So, William, if you want to watch them, I didn't know the Maury one was online. I didn't know yeah, that. It's online. That's one of the first debates I watch. And like I said, when I was very anti Catholic and pro Calvinist, I wanted Maury to smash you. I'm just sorry. So, but I have repented of my sins. So I love you, doctor. So continue. Oh, well, that I don't know if I'm that good of a debater. I wasn't that prepared. Yeah. I think the one debate I had with White, because he's a he does this for a living, it seems, was <laughs> on justification. I don't yeah, think yeah. he I I did not he he had trouble seeing connections. He's very like uh, codified or he's he's puts things in departments and he said I was shifting the, the debate. No, I wasn't, because I was giving him examples of how one could lose one's justification from Scripture. Yeah. And, and I said, if you could lose your justification by sin, then it's not by faith alone. Right. That you also need the obedience of faith in a moral light, up, upright. You could lose your just. And he said, I was shifting it to uh, um, security of salvation. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I said, they're all interconnected. They are. If St. Paul, the the... He was talking, he wrote the, the first letter to the Corinthians to the saints, to the holy ones living there. 
Yeah. And then he gives them a warning about certain actions, certain sins in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, which will deprive them of the kingdom of heaven. So he, he, he he's, he's un showing that it's not faith alone. And, yeah. it, and if I have faith great enough to move mountains, but if I have not charity, I'm nothing. That kind of, this was being thrown at Luther. And he, he just says, no, it's not, it's not faith formed by charity it's faith and faith alone he was aware uh, that 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 scripture could be used against his position of faith alone but you know yeah. we love individual protestants we are to love them and we're to love our enemies um i i have nothing first i have to love james white i have to love these anti-catholic polemicists dr fastici earlier we 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 briefly touched upon uh, the word um, anathema. Now you it is tossed about a lot online, and we hear uh, definitions given by evangelicals. Um, Doctor Fastici, plain and simple, what, what really is an anathema? According to Second Nicaea, was it condemning people to hell as well? And you know exactly how would you define what an anathema is historically used? Yeah, well, it, it's used in the New Testament several times by Paul. In Galatians, he says, if anyone preaches to you a, a gospel other than the one I have preached to you, let that one be anathema. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, a, a harsh translation would be accursed. A more gentle one would be condemned. Yeah. But you know what? What I think I mentioned this to you once before, William. If you look at some of the later councils, like Trent, and Vatican I, they have anathemas, yep. but they have anathemas against prop uh, positions, propositions. Correct. Yep. The, the, the trouble with um, condemning individuals is people write different things at different times. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes what they were writing is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So when we discussed Honorius, this was the case that uh, was he, he was anathematized and then Leo II kind of when he confirmed the decrees of the council kind of uh, condemned him for negligence rather yeah. than heresy per se. And of course, he, he couldn't be guilty of formal heresy because he was dead and right. heresy to be obstinate. Right. And he was not obstinate at all. You know, he was trying to work out the matter uh, in his own way. But in retrospect, it seems like he, he, he didn't realize that inadvertently he was supporting the heresy. But, so this this can happen, but, you know, look at Trent. It doesn't condemn Luther and Calvin by name. Correct. Yep. It, it condemns right. many positions that it would seem that they, they would hold to. And, and and then we have we have the interesting case of Blessed Antonio Rosmini, an Italian uh, blessed founder of the Institute of Charity. He died in 1855. Mm. But there was a posthumous condemnation of some of his positions. But they were even some of his enemies were even taking things out of his un, unedited works. So they were taking things out of context. And so when he was up for beatification, I think it was 2001, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith had to qualify those condemnations mm -hmm. and to say what the, the, those condemnations have to be understood as warnings about certain interpretations yeah his propositions but they don't correspond to what he really intended so that the, the, the that so even being condemned by the holy office was not seen to be an obstacle to his beatification so it's a, it's a good example because sometimes people say different things and at different points so mm -hmm. uh i think trent was wise not to anathematize persons right but, but, you know, even if you're anathematized, we cannot make a judgment on the person's um, inner culpability. Mm -hmm. Even if someone is excommunicated, it's not the same as being condemned to hell. Right? It's, it's, it's a judgment based upon the evidence there. But God is the ultimate judge of the human heart. Dr. Fustigi, I, I'm glad you bring that up. And I'm glad that we briefly talked about uh, the act of of ecumenical councils earlier. And I kind of waited uh, uh, almost for, past 49 minutes to bring it up 
kind of like a a grand kind of uh, finale question to throw at you because this Dr. Fastigi has come up more than anything else I've seen. I have been witness to fellow Catholics, fellow Orthodox that have no idea how to deal with this. And I don't know why. I remember I talked to you on the phone. I talked to uh, Father Kappas on the phone about this not long back. He gave me the exact answer you gave me. And I talked to you a few days ago. We communicated with you as to how people are putting so much weight on the ACTA within ecumenical councils. I mean, do let me just be clear. There is so much within ACTA. There's even dialogues that is sometimes recorded in the active yet ecumenical councils. Are you going to put that as uh, having dogmatic weight? Now, in particular, is Second Nicaea, and I'm glad I'm bringing it up because I was looking in the chat briefly, and I think an evangelical, I imagine, wrote, and look at this. Now they are shifting the tap to the Orthodox. He said, if Orthodox don't worship icons and symbols, why does the Seventh Council state that whoever doesn't kiss it, the icon, loses their salvation. They are anathematized. They are alluding to the acta that I brought up to you, Dr. Vestigi, when we talked not long back, where uh, and the anathema of the council where it says that we must kiss icons or statues. We're then told, and I'm going to quote, virtually quote Dr. Ortland, who says that Nicaea II anathematizes to hell those that reject it. Icon veneration, and he quotes from the uh, the act of the council. I remember when we dialogued about this, you you told me, well, look, I know what Canon 3 says, uh, but, you know, people are citing texts from the ACTA, which don't have binding authority. That's How are they confusing this, Dr. Vestigi? Well, they're using the ACTA. They, they, they have a polemical intent. So they're picking something out, which they seem seems to be extreme from the ACTA, and using it to try to ridicule Catholic and Orthodox faith. But you, you see, we have to go by what was approved in by the council itself in its decrees. Yeah, and yeah. so the Octa were not approved. I mean, the, 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 there sometimes are discussions and proposals and so on. Um, and it's, it's important to, you know, it's good to read them and to see the attitude but, for example, in the Octa of Vatican I, there's a Schema de Ecclesia, a, a, a draft on the church, but it was never voted on. Right. Now, you could cite that and see some interesting uh, theological points, and it's a, it's a document, but you cannot quote it as the authority of the ecumenical council. Yeah. yeah. And you, you see people misinterpret also Pastor Eternus of Vatican I, and they put a kind of spin, um, they put a spin on uh, what uh, Bishop Gosser said. Right. And they misinterpret his reference to Bellarmine. And they're thinking of another fourth point of Bellarmine when he actually, the one part that, that uh, Bishop Gosser quotes, which he says, this is the view of the council, is what Bellarmine says in De, De Romano, Pontifice, Book 4, Chapter 6, yeah. where he basically says that um, it's not only pious and probable that there will never be a, a heretical pope, but you could prove it. It would be offensive mm -hmm. to God's divine providence. And then he said it's never, there's never been a heretical pope, or you can't prove a heretical pope ever existed. So this is a sign it cannot happen. Mm -hmm. And so then when you read passages in, in, in Pastor Eternus, that that the you know the apostolic see has remained immaculate mm -hmm. um, and the pope has been the successor of peter is given the charism of truth and never failing faith you understand it in light of what that is but what the authoritative text is what is said in pastor eternus yeah and and so that's what we would have to go by the acta are interesting but some people read the acta as having more authority than the text of the council. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, now, um, you know, the, 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 there were different types of excommunication in church history. And, right. but we did not have a unified code of canon law till 1917. 
and then that was replaced by the the code of canon law 1983 and now excommunication is more like medicinal it means you remain a catholic but you've lost certain privileges that is access to the sacraments until you repent it's meant to bring wake people up and bring them back whereas before there were there were more severe major excommunications now the code of canon uh, for East, uh, the 1990 unified code for the eastern catholic churches is a little different on this they still have something approaching a major excommunication but for the latin rite no the the, the excommunication is really more medicinal it's a wake up call yeah. you're going to lose these privileges until you remove the obstacle for the reason why you were excommunicated those are great, great points there, Dr. Fisici. I think really, um, I think we've pretty much hit uh, pretty much everything. I mean, if, if you want to get to any questions, I think we covered the meat and potatoes of that, Sam. Big Dr. Fisici knocked out of the park. In fact, I would love for you to come back, uh, Dr. Fisici, because uh, I say this, and I'm not saying it in front of you, but I love your style of presentation. It's clear, it's articulate, and I'm able to listen to you and absorb what you have to say and that's i praise god for that gift so if you guys don't mind i have some regulars here and as my precious brother in the lord <clears throat> knows uh, we have a lot of orthodox that come here and sometimes yep. there's like bad blood among the orthodox and the catholic and they go at it in my comment section even though i try to tell them please don't do it here my channel is open for all the ancient apostolic traditions amen you know, you're my family. I love you. I want to serve you. If you have any differences, take it to your channels. But this one bro brother keeps saying, and William addressed it, that the Eastern Orthodox actually define an anathema as that you're cut off, you're not saved, and the act is binding, and therefore to reject it, you're pretty much condemned. So he's saying that's what the Eastern Orthodox told him. And you're coming from the Roman Catholic perspective. So I don't know if you guys want to address it. You might, You know much more about the ancient traditions and the Orthodox and I do. So how would you address this claim? Because he keeps making that claim. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fasici, you want you want to go first? And maybe I can follow yeah. up and add anything? Well, the, the church can make a judgment and anathematize someone for heresy. And it might involve, uh, like uh, with the case of Nestorius, uh, de uh, being deposed from his uh, patriarchal see and then being sent in exile. So there, there could be severe consequences of teaching a heresy. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a way the church shows how serious she takes orthodoxy and those who teach error have to be set up as an example. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. a simple distinction between the church excommunicating or anathematizing someone and sending someone to hell. Yeah, we we don't we that's out of our competence, even yeah. the competence of the Pope. <laughs> so, uh, no, the Pope can't send anyone to hell. In fact, I follow St. John Paul II, who said, really, hell is a self exclusion. Mm -hmm. In other words, God wishes everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's first Timothy 2 4. Those who would go to hell are resist God's call to repentance. Yeah. And even some people who might be in error, um, they might be in error sincerely, in good faith, right? Even though they're mistaken and they don't realize their error, so they're not fully culpable. So God will have to judge them. We have to leave some of the the the, the the ultimate state of someone's soul to the almighty. Hmm. Can yeah, I to add to that? Let me briefly, really quickly add one more, one thing. Um, no, if, if anybody, and I, one thing that I don't like doing is assuming that anybody actually told somebody something without hearing it or being witness to it. But I don't know a living Orthodox scholar. And I know a lot of them. A lot of them are really good friends of mine. I don't know a living one that would believe that the acta of an ecumenical council are binding. That is 
absolutely ludicrous. If that would be binding, we would have a tons of things, mere dialogues that are going on that are preserved in many of these councils would be binding. That is absolutely ludicrous. And I do not think any Eastern Orthodox would say that. By the way, from people that are wondering, about a year and a half back, uh, I was one of the ones that ran a conference which was helmed by Father Coppice that had Eastern Orthodox from all over the world that were part of the conference. And I can tell you, none of those top scholars in the world would believe that ACTA from an ecumenical council are binding. So let me just ease your concerns to my Eastern Orthodox friends. If anybody said that, they were merely an error. Yeah, in fact, I, I see now the source of his misinformation. And I just warned him in the comments section. Yeah, because what are you talking about? He's saying he's asking honest questions. So I'm going to give him one more chance because he's come before and looks sincere. So I'm going to give you one more chance. I usually don't do that with trolls I've locked. His authority is Craig Trulia. And I know for myself, and you know for myself, very well, uh, that Craig Trulia does not speak on behalf of the entire Orthodox Church. No. And I'm not trying to all. name call him or attack him. He keeps uh, appealing to him. He's constantly in the comment section appealing to him. All right. Yeah. So now here, just uh, before you comment, we have now someone who is one of my mods, and I love this brother passionately, and he's shown that he knows this stuff. Here's an Orthodox. This is an Orthodox. Now, he appealed to Craig Trulia. Now, Ortho Christos, who's my mod, who loves the Lord, and he's one of those who agrees to disagree, mm -hmm. and he doesn't condemn people who are not Orthodox. He agrees that the Orthodox Church is a true church, but he won't condemn me and sign me or you to hell. Mm -hmm. Look what he just said. I am not a scholar, but as far as I know, even the Orthodox Church itself does not say it sends people to hell. Only God can do that. So now, Narrow Gate, you got your answer. You bring it up again, then you're trolling. I'm going to block yeah. you and I'm going to get you out of here. Stop the trolling yeah. because Greg Trulia is not a bishop. He's not a priest. He's not a scholar. He doesn't speak for the entire Orthodox Church. Leave yeah. it at that. Maybe we'll bring an Orthodox scholar to give the Orthodox perspective. Dr. Fastigi is a scholar of the yep. Roman Catholic Church. So I just wanted to bring that clear. Now, guys, if you have questions, tag me at Shamuni and I'll ask. And I have a, one more question because this one is ki kind of controversial because you have Catholics who are bringing it up. And I don't know. I know some may be said of a Cantus, so I'm not talking about them. There are some individuals that deny they are, but they also said they had a problem with the <clears throat> idols of Pachamama. And they speak out against the Pope for that. So now the Orthodox are wondering, well, okay, you have Catholics who are condemning this as idolatry. So what do you say to those Catholics? He has Dr. a great answer. He's uh, Dr. Vestici is the perfect one for this. Go ahead, doctor. Well, well I, I heard this from some people, some associates, even some, some friends. And I watched the video of the prayer service. And... I understand Italian, and when they had, there was a mat, it was called a mandala, and the friar said these are symbols on the mat of earth, water, seeds, and martyrs. So they had photographs of like a nun who was killed for trying to defend the, the Brazilian uh, uh, rainforest. And, and so they were symbols and then at one brief moment, the people bowed down to, to pray. That's how I interpret it. In a prostate, you know, they, they bow down. But do you worship symbols? And the word Pachamama did not appear. I think Pope Francis inadvertently made a mistake when that one uh, Austrian young man, maybe quite sincerely, took the wooden statues of this pregnant woman and threw them in the Tiber. Well, they, they were recovered. So Pope Francis said, we have good news. The Pachamamas have been recovered. But that was a, just a word that the Italian press was using. But I have actually done research on this. And twice, St. John Paul II in addresses referred to Pachamama as just Mother Earth. And he said to, to in Ecuador, and I think another one, he was talking to uh, a group um, uh, uh, in another South American country, I think Bolivia. And he said, this is what you're, you know, we honor the Earth. 
we, we, as God's creation that brings forth fruit. This is what your ancestors called Pachamama. Hmm. So it was like a preparation for the gospel. And this Pedro Gabriel, who's a medical doctor, but a very good researcher, he showed in his research that in the Amazon, there's no cult of Pachamama to worship. A mama that's in the Andes, in just localized in the Andes. So there's confusion there. And people fell for this. And then they use bad methodology. They make the accusation. Yes, it's idolatry. And then you have to prove that it wasn't. No, it's the reverse. If you're saying that there was a, 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 a idolatry, you have to prove it. But they can't prove it. Because to prove it, you would I you have to know the moral object and you have to know the intention. And they and unless unless it was said that um during the ceremony, now we're gonna worship the goddess Pachamama, then it would be idolatry. But nothing like that was said. So it's it's really a violation of the eighth commandment. People don't realize this. To say there was idolatry there. It's what is called rash judgment. The, at, at least we could say whatever happened there, I don't know what it was, but I can't say for sure it was idolatry because I don't know the inner intentions of those people who bow down before those multiple symbols. They could have been praying for the Amazon. They could have been praying for the success of the synod. Yep. To say that they were committing idolatry is unjust because you can you cannot make an accusation without evidence you it's an impression like like uh, uh, as is said in second samuel when when david was was chosen you know the sons of jesse and uh, and it said you know man judges by appearances god judges from the heart so people were making a judgment based upon appearances but God has to judge the heart. This is basic moral theology. But I'm surprised that people at high levels, bishops and, and others, just make it, they assume that it was idolatry. And if it were, you know, uh, it, 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 um, I would be against it. But I, I, I just say, well, prove to me it was idolatry. And you can't prove it because you don't know the intention. Great you know what I've concluded, uh, just uh, Dr. Fastigi, if someone has made up their mind, no matter, no amount of evidence will prove the contrary. So like here, yeah. for example, Colbius, you're giving the understanding from the Catholic perspective, idolatry is not just something external, it's internal in the heart, and you have to have access to their inclinations, why they're doing it. No matter how many times you say it, because someone has made up his mind, no, I have to find a reason to condemn the Catholic Church. You are guilty until proven innocent because now he's saying it's idolatry according to the seven council. And I don't want you to address it. I just want to hammer the point. When you've made up your mind, don't ask questions. See, there's the thing. If you think it's idolatry, that's between you and God and you'll answer to God. So don't ask questions that you don't want answers for. See, this is the thing I don't like. Me personally, why are you asking me a question? Do you want a real answer? Or are you asking because you're trying to set me up in order to use it? to bash me and discredit me been there done that got the t-shirt and i retired the t-shirt so stop asking that. if you guys think it's idolatry all the more power to you he just answered this question twice you don't like the answer all right don't accept it leave it be stop pursuing this matter because now you're here to cause a division i'm going to start blocking you because i have this rare virus called blockalitis <laughs> and it starts acting up when my arm my left arm starts itching i gotta start block 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 so shut up and move on now yep. two more questions because i don't see any other questions that are relevant and, and I'll, make a, I'll make a brief let me make a brief comment brother because people will not retire it look if you people tuning in if you think the acta of an ecumenical council or binding Go for it. Go ahead. If you only realized dialogues are preserved in ACTA, if you've actually delved into the councils and read the ACTA, go get the, the volumes that you can find from Father Price, or a lot of them are available online. If you think, because sometimes the ACTA are massively voluminous, if you think all of those are binding, 
have at it. There's nothing I can do. If to, if you're at that point where nothing we can tell you will register and you are still stuck on, well, the actor says that, it must be true. At this point, there's really nothing. Yeah, don't waste your time. Do. There's yeah, nothing enough. anybody can do for you. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If you guys made up your mind, stop asking. Yeah. yeah. You got your answer. You don't like the answer? All right. Shelve it. Move on. Yep. This is their answer. They're not convinced it's idolatry. You're convinced it is? All right. Agree to disagree. Yep. Move on. Stop pressing the point unless you're using the devil to come and distract. Yep. And then I'm going to have to cure my blockitis and start blocking <laughs> until I'm satisfied for a month. Ugh. Anyway, coming back to the issue. Because, again, I'm not just saying it. It is an honor that my brother William brought Dr. Fastigi on this meager <laughs> channel. The man is a scholar, a world, and he doesn't say that. I'm saying that. Let another man praise you, Proverbs 27, 2. He is a bona fide scholar who passionately loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and he loves the church. For him to take time, and he doesn't charge a penny. He didn't ask me to pay him. There are people who charge fees to appear on channels to speak. I know people not mentioning names. They will only give you one hour of their time and or charge you for that hour yep. to come on your channel. This man asked not for a single penny. He came out of his love for the Lord Jesus and the church to <clears throat> educate us. And I thank him for that. And I respect him for it. And I would hope he'll come back. Now I have just two questions. One was asked about, because I know this is also the Catholic church is the same with the Eastern Orthodox church. Obviously, the Eastern Orthodox Church, Catholic Church, rejects penal substitutionary atonement, that God punished Jesus and poured out his wrath on Jesus. Am I correct? And if so, why? Why would that be the case, if you guys want to answer? Go ahead. Um, William, do you want to answer that, or I, I could take a step? Yeah, you can You can go ahead and take it. I think you would, you would you'd be way clearer than me. Well, that we see in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21, St. Paul says, he who did not know sin became sin. Now, what does that mean? He became sin by representing vicariously sinful humanity, but we cannot say that our Lord Jesus Christ was sinful. That would be blasphemy. It says in Hebrews uh, 4.15, he was like us in all things, but without sin. So if, like Luther said in one homily, Jesus became the worst ad uh, adulterer, the worst murderer. Well, he didn't. He was without sin. But he represented sinful humanity and he freely offered himself. Uh, we could, you know, there's some degree of truth, you could say, as a substitution but what is wrong is this idea that the wrath of God, the Father, then was poured out on his son. Uh, um, this is anthropomorphism. It He freely gave himself. It was a death he freely accepted. And he made an offering out of love. And, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, said that God was not required even to become man to redeem us. He's omnipotent. He could have redeemed us just by willing it. But he chose this way. He chose to redeem us by becoming incarnate and going to uh, to the cross. And and so this, uh, um, this is out of his great love for us. So penal substitution, it has an element of truth in it, but it ultimately it's uh, it's dangerous. And the Catholic Church doesn't accept it. Neither do you, some Orthodox. Now, William, you want, you want to add something today? No, I'm completely on board. I think, well, I'll add one thing. Even though I don't have the list with me and have to get them, uh, what Dr. Festici laid out there is very patristic as well. It has Let's a clear basis in the early. We will do it. Let's do a Bring session. The, the fathers on. Let's do the session. We will do it. Now, for Dr. Festici, he may not know, uh, I'm late to the game. I'm unlearning all that reform theology, relearning and learning afresh. Now that I've come under the conviction I was wrong, but glory to God, better late than never. So I need to learn this stuff. I'm still a neophyte when it comes to the issue. So this is why you're blessing me to learn these issues because I'm late to the game. I'm 50. I don't have, if the Lord is pleased to give me 20 years, I may not have 20 years, years to learn what you already know, right? 50 so, years young. 
Well, I don't I hope so. I hope I get stay healthy and lean. But now two final questions. This one is from Diego. Thoughts on St. Thomas allowing Latria to be given to the cross. Please correct me if I'm wrong. See, he's not certain. He's probably heard yeah. that Thomas Aquinas allowed Latria, which is the worship given to God alone, to the cross. So if so, why? And if not, is that is he yeah. an error? Yes, actually, that that this was taken up. Um, I might not be able to find the exact passage, but Ludwig Ott, Father Ludwig Ott, kind of tries to cover for St. Thomas there. And he says, what we'd have to understand is that this is relative yeah. latria. Yeah, relative correct. latria. So he qualifies yeah. it. I mean, we honor St. Thomas Aquinas, but I actually think he could have been clearer there. We don't worship the wood of the cross. We worship Christ. And so can it's I add a kind something of symbolic to worship. Can, can I add something to that? Now, I've looked into that. Uh, and I'm glad it got brought up. I've looked uh, deep into that. And and I agree on one point that I, I wish St. Thomas Aquinas were a little clearer there. But I think he's really hearkening to the great St. John Damascene. Because if you look at Damascene, I don't know where off the top of my head, but it is on, on the Orthodox faith. He does talk about the wood, talks about it having been made holy because of the holy body and blood that was touching it. And he talks about giving Latria worship and it ultimately going to our Lord. So it's very similar to the language of John Damascene, even though I think yeah. Thomas Aquinas could, could have been a little bit clearer. Very clearly, I think he took it from St. John. So well, hold on, let me get this right. Go ahead, brother. You're telling me Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest minds who loved the Lord Jesus, still could be mistaken and still could have worded himself a little better so you don't swear by him as if he's infallible? Are you kidding me? You're correct. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, now, I, I, I would I would say that, and I think St. Thomas would say that. Yep. He was a humble man. <laughs> Amen. Right, praise the Lord. Now, the final question for now, because I don't see any other questions. I have, a, and, and why was I laughing, by the way, Dr. Sestigi, when you mentioned Ludwig Ott in my anti Catholic days, Ludwig Ott was one of James White's favorite authors to use against the Catholic Church. <laughs> and so when you mention him, it's like it brought back memories. My anti Catholic days where the Pope is actually influenced by the Masons and there's a black Pope. In the <laughs> And the Jesuit Society of Jesus were started to infiltrate the churches, Dr. Festigi. No, I'm kidding. That's <laughs> final question, because I always understood it this way. And I just want to make sure I understood what you're saying, because I want people to understand how anathemas work. Even though the church may pronounce an anathema on a teaching. And if someone holds it, that means that person's teaching is condemned and he's viewed as a heretic. But that still doesn't mean, and this is my question, if I got it right, that that person may not end up being saved due to the mercy of God because that person may be holding this teaching being invincibly ignorant otherwise. In other words, he doesn't know this is true because he hasn't received enough information or knowledge this is true. So he's thinking he's opposing false doctrine. And because of that invincible ignorance, though the teaching is condemned, he still may be saved by God. But from the church's perspective, since it's heretical, he cannot be in communion with the church. Am I understanding this? Yes. In other words, if it's the excommunication according to the 1983 Latin Code, he does not. He cannot celebrate. He cannot participate in the sacraments. You know, but that doesn't mean if he dies of a heart attack, he goes to hell, though excommunicated. That would be it, it, because God is the one who has to judge the inner culpability. Mm -hmm. So for a mortal sin, it is Catholic doctrine that those who die in unrepentant mortal sin go to hell. But a mortal sin requires first grave matter. It requires um, sufficient knowledge and deliberate or full consent. So ignorance would mean there's insufficient knowledge. Sometimes people sincerely are just mistaken. So that's why we say, uh, uh, and it wasn't just at Vatican II, it was held by many theologians and even uh, Pope Pius XII in uh, 1854, then repeated in 1863, spoke about invincible ignorance 
of the true faith that God takes into account for non-Christians. So you could have a Muslim or a Hindu. They, they don't understand that Jesus is really the savior of the human race. I mean, for the Muslims, he's a prophet and messenger, but he's not the son of God. So there could be invincible ignorance. This is what they were raised to believe. And even when they meet Christians, they say, oh, well, they, they associate that which is not God with God. This is a great offense. So God will have to take into account um, whether there's ignorance or non-culpable ignorance. It could be culpable ignorance if someone um, is, being, uh, is being moved to accept the truth and just says, I don't want to hear it. Obstinate. Obstinate. Resistance. But this is something that God has to sort out. So someone who's excommunicated, anathematized, we don't have to despair of their eternal salvation. God, who is merciful, will know whether or not they were they were uh, teaching heresy. In you know, we don't want to use the expression in good faith, but they were teaching error without culpability. They didn't yeah. quite realize it. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I want to make this the final question because this man is on a journey. The Triune God in His mercy introduced me to him. He was a Christian minister. Who became a Muslim and he was featured on a Muslim channel and then he prayed for a sign this man's question I'm gonna give you the background he's here listening he said God if Christianity is true then have one of the apologists online that deal with Muslims find this five-minute clip because a Muslim had taken a five-minute clip of his conversion that he became a Muslim and respond to it unbeknownst to me I had not, no idea I saw the clip and I responded he found my response and he took it as a sign God was showing him Christianity is true. So he called me and we had a discussion. It's on my channel. Wow. He now recanted Muhammad. He's back worshiping, glorifying, loving the triune God. Amen. But he's drawn to the apostolic churches. And mm -hmm. so he, coming from a Protestant background, he was taught penal substitution atonement like me. So now he wants to know. Okay, what is the Catholic view of Christ's death if it's not penal substitutionary atonement? So this is why I want this question, because he's on a journey, and he's coming to the fullness of the truth. So yes, what is well, it? It's, it, it, it's, you know, there's different models of redemption, and it's like the church sees truth in all of them. I mean, one is that by Jesus' death, he liberated us from uh, captivity by, uh, of the devil. So that is a kind of uh, liberation or ransom from captivity. Then there was, uh, well, what is called recapitulation. And, and some of the Byzantines, hold, uh, many of them hold this, that Adam was the first head of the human race. Jesus becomes the new head of the human race. And so he recapitulates or re uh, uh, human history and so by believing in Jesus and being united to him we become divinized that's how we are saved but yeah. the more common view is and the Anselmian view which is not penal substitution it's vicarious atonement Jesus representing sinful humanity makes the atoning sacrifice and it's scriptural that he is expiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. First John 2.2. 2. Mm -hmm. So he is expiation. And then a third model is example of love. This was Peter Abelard that Jesus gives. I mean, this fourth model, he provides a great model. But in terms of an authoritative statement, it comes from the Council of Trent's decree on justification. So it's the question, what are the causes of our justification that we are made just in Christ? And it just deals with the different levels of, of causality. And it doesn't go, it allows for some different explanations of this, but in the decree on justification, it's chapter seven, what are the causes of our just the causes of justification are the following 
The final cause is the glory of God and of Christ and of life everlasting. The efficient cause is the merciful God who gratuitously, gratuitously washes and sanctifies, sealing and anointing with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The meritorious cause is the most beloved, only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, while we were enemies of the, out of the great love with which he loved us, merited for us justification by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross and made satisfaction for us to God the Father. So it's satisfaction. He did what is satus, enough, to make atonement for our sin. But we call this the Paschal mystery. A mystery is something we don't fully understand. But it's a mystery. And so we speak of the Paschal mystery. Yes, it was anticipated in the Old Testament. They had all these sacrifices. And they would sacrifice the unblemished lamb on Passover. But now the new Pascha, the new Passover is Jesus, the Lamb of God, making the sufficient offering. Now, how exactly does it work? It just tells us he merited for us justification by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross and made satisfaction for us to God the Father. And the instrumental cause is the sacrament of baptism. The single formal cause is the justice of God and so on. But in other words, when we describe from a Catholic view, Jesus making atonement for our sins, we want to call it a mystery. This is what how God chose to redeem us. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was anticipated in Isaiah 52 and 53. It was prophesied that, you know, um, upon him was the guilt of us all. By his stripes we are healed. Amen. And St. Saint, Saint Thomas, you know, raises the question whether it was necessary for the redemption of the world that God become man. And his answer is mine. It wasn't absolutely necessary because God is omnipotent. He could have redeemed us in many ways. But he chose this way because it was most fitting. And he gives about 15 different reasons why the incarnation and the passion and death of our Lord was the most fitting. It reveals to us the horror of sin. It increases our faith, hope, and charity. It increases our gratitude to God. So this was the sacrifice the, that was sufficient. St. Anselm said, well, we are the ones who sin, so we are the ones who should make it up, but we're incapable. So God becomes man so that he could then make the adequate atonement, the expiation for our sins as the Paschal Lamb. But we call it the Paschal Mystery, the mystery of the Christian Passover, precisely because it is a mystery. So the penal substitutionary theory is just one way of looking at it, but I think it's a deficient way of looking at it. The, the deeper view is to say he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world out of great love for us. Out of great love, knowing that we cannot atone for the sins of the whole world, that he becomes the, the new, the unblemished Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He makes the offering and it was acceptable to God the Father. And he freely underwent this out of his great love for us. Um, and it was an offering that was all sufficient. That's scriptural. Expiation for our sins and those of the whole world. Mm. This is what God chose, how God chose to redeem us. But it is still a mystery. We, we forget it's called the mystery of the Pascha. Yeah. It's a mystery as to how this redeemed, but we know that this is how we are redeemed. And then we are out of his great love 
you know, he, he, we were in misery, but then God has mercy. And then we know that through the cross, we are healed. That the cross is our hope. The cross and resurrection show that death and sin have been overcome. It's all part of the, the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. Hallelujah. You guys saw what I said about his passion, love for Jesus Christ. You just saw it perfectly illustrated. Amen. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit anointing him do so. Do you see the deep love? passion he has for Jesus, our God and Savior, and his deep appreciation for what Jesus did on the cross, the love for the triune God. And this is why I, I regret all these years I thought the Catholic Church was the enemy and it was Antichrist because I didn't know any better. I was an example of being invincibly, invincibly stupid, but thank the Lord he cured me of it. Amen. Here's an illustration that this man loves the true God, the triune God. He loves the Bible. He loves the Lord Jesus, and he loves the church, and he's passionate. May the Lord make me passionate for the truth and all of you, for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, before I conclude, William, did you want to add something? I was blown away. I, okay. The only thing I'll add is yeah. I am I am blessed that you joined us today, Dr. Fastigian. Oh, I'm going to have to bring you back on in the future. Oh, without, a doubt, without a doubt, bring you back. Well, I am blessed well, to be able to call you my friend. Thank you for blessing us, right. brother. I want to say this, Dr. Fastigi, seeing you now with these eyes that God has given me, not the eyes that I had where I hated the Catholic Church. And I say this and I mean this. And William knows me. I'm not politically correct. So I hope you don't watch too much of my videos. You may not come back. You may not like my approach. But I can tell you, I am so blessed by the Lord that he allowed me to hear you on my channel. And I want to say I see the passionate beauty and love of Jesus in you. I've seen it in a couple of the Catholic apologists. One was actually even when he came, when I looked at his face, Robert Sengenis, it looked like what Stephen looked like. Your face and Sengenis' face was like an angel. I'm looking at an angel because of your love for Jesus. And I, I am honored that you came here. And I pray the Lord will use you. And you pray that I can be in love with Jesus with the passion you have. Amen. And so with that said, I just want to know if this is true. Joan of Arc did die excommunicated, but she's now a saint. So isn't that a, an example? Someone could be excommunicated, but actually be canonized as a saint. Is that true? Is that that statement? I don't know much about the history. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was a it was a mock trial for political reasons, and she was unjustly accused of witchcraft, and See? she was unjustly unjustly executed. She was burned at the stake, but then the case was sent to Rome because it wasn't the Pope who ordered this, it was a corrupt bishop. And uh, and then she was exonerated 25 years later, but they studied the, the case and and Glory. so Amen. she was, you, you could have individual members of the church commit grave acts of injustice. I mean, more recent years, we have uh, the case of Cardinal, ex-Cardinal McCarrick, I mean, he was appointed a cardinal, made a cardinal by St. John Paul II. Yeah. But he yeah. did so innocently. But this man was an abuser, a serial abuser. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. there are cases like this. I mean, look, even in our Lord chose Judas, but he betrayed him. Yeah. Yeah. And he chose yeah. Peter, who denied him, but he reinstated Peter. Oh, and yeah. I, I heard a homily on this, you know, what? Look at the one, the great apostles that Jesus chose. Peter, who denied him three times, and Paul, who who was trying to kill Christians, arrest them. Yeah. But this is a yeah. sign, like St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the surpassing power comes from God and not from us. So we're fragile earthen vessels, even the Pope. Uh, you know, Pope Francis is not perfect. He's aware of that. But his Episcopal and Papal motto is um, miserando atque eligendo. And that comes from the commentary of St. Bede on the Gospel of Matthew that our Lord uh, uh, miserando, looking upon him with mercy. On So Jesus looked upon St. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, with mercy, and cho he chose him. 
looking upon him with mercy and choosing him. So this is the way Francis felt. I, God must have mercy upon me for why he chose me to be a bishop and then the pope because he knows his own weaknesses. But Peter was a weak man. He denied our Lord, but he was also a strong man in faith. Yeah. So yeah. God chooses sometimes the weak of the world, the poor of the world, to give him glory. It's his sovereign choice. And we, we, we could almost repent collectively of the unjust execution of Joan of Arc. The church corrected that mistake. She's now a saint in heaven. Amen. 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 She's not perfected. Glory to God. Beautiful session. I learned a lot. And please come back with William. William, do you want to make a final comment? We're going to wrap my it up. Final, yeah, my final comment is I, I, I knew we were going to have a lot of fun. And I knew yeah. bringing Dr. Fastigi would really clear up a lot of the misunderstandings on the Second Council of Nicaea. But we learned a lot. Not only about Second Nicaea. We learned a whole lot about anathemas, icon veneration, latria, dulia, proscuneo. And I have to say, I've been incredibly edified being with you, both you brothers this evening, as yeah. you, you know, both of you have been near and dear friends of mine for many years. And I'm going to try to arrange a session, even with my dear friend, Dr. Brock, maybe have all of us here. Please. Dr. Brock is amazing, very good friend of mine as well, and very friendly to the apostolic churches. So We'll try and get something like that arranged, and we'll get it done. No, it was a blessing. I really was blessed to have you here, and I mean this again from my heart. Just hearing you and your gentleness and humbleness and your brilliance, you moved me in my heart, and I thank Jesus Christ for beatifying human vessels like you to show how beautiful our Lord is, and may he preserve you, my brother William, and I pray the Lord will have mercy on me that I don't shame him but walk worthy of the Lord. And please come back. I want you guys to come back. I want Dr. Fastigia to come back. You are a well of information, but it's not just knowledge. I can see the knowledge has penetrated your heart, and you love Jesus. And that's what's important, loving our Lord. And I pray I love the Lord the way you do, and I pray William will grow to be a mighty, spirit-filled lover of Jesus, never backing down. So God bless you guys all. Now, I sent you a link. I can go late tonight and do a session if you want. So I posted a community post where I give you the times I can do a session tonight. So go there if you want me to do a session tonight on Jehovah being pierced and genies in Islam. If not, I can do it tomorrow night. But tomorrow night, I can only do it late night, God willing. So go there and vote if you want me to do it. What time? If not, if I don't see you later, I'll see you tomorrow if the Lord wills. And Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. <clears throat> Maranathe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sam. Good And good to meet you. And thank you for your great faith. Thank May you. May God bless you. And, and you too, William. God bless you. you. We'll, we'll be in touch, okay? Okay. Yeah.